God good to us. Everything that we have, we bring to Him as an offering today. I'm glad you've come to worship. Let's sing together that great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God. A
You heard it begin the service with this song. The song that says, Lord, everything I am and everything I have, I give it to you. So we invite you now to sing with us. I think you'll pick it up quickly. Let's sing it. And sing it with all your heart. Everything I am. quarter an ancient Hebrew expression, <laughs> wow. Do you see what happens when we bring to God everything we have? I mean, if what you can do is play an electric guitar, is that worthy of bringing to God? If what you can do is sing, is that worth bringing to God? If what you can do is drama, is that worth bringing to God? There isn't a gift. There isn't a skill. There isn't a piece of knowledge that you have that cannot be used for the glory of God. If only we will have the courage to give it to Him without reservations and let Him shape it and let Him mold it. I'm going to ask Dr. Jim Shaddix to lead us in a word of prayer. Jim, would you pray for us, please?
Amen. Before you sit down, tell somebody next to you, God is good all the time. Would you do that? Put the mic back there. Okay, thank you so very much. What a wonderful week this has been for us at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, enjoying the church at Brook Hills. This is a congregation that is alive and growing and healthy. Dr. Randy Millwood is helping us identify healthy churches across our country as we are really trying to understand what God is doing in the lives of many churches in a lot of different ways to do church, a lot of ways that we can glorify God, that we can impact the community for Christ, win lost people to Christ. But what we're seeing today is one way, one church is reaching their community for Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask Brother Rick if he'll come up here for a moment. I want to ask you a couple of questions, Rick. Our seminary family knows I like to give pop tests from time to time. And yes, so sir. one of the things that everybody's really uh, has really enjoyed about uh, this week and they're really curious about is the way you dress to preach on Sunday mornings at the church at Brook Hill. And uh, all of us like dressing casually, but how did you come to do that? Did you just announce to the congregation one day that you were throwing away your suits and going to dress casual on Sunday? Uh, how did you do that? Well, we started from the beginning with a philosophy that uh, we wanted everyone who would come to be comfortable and uh, to be relaxed in an environment where they would be as free as possible to hear everything that God had to say. I did teach to them that the biblical dress code was to be clothed in humility and righteousness. And other than that, it's optional. Just don't do something that would be distasteful or take uh, a left turn at Scripture. And um, there's folks in our church that wear ties and wear suits. Uh, and then there's folks that, that recognize it's... Uh, it's not the requirement, so uh, it's 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 not something that we that we mandate or make someone feel strange if they prefer to dress up. The idea is for you to be relaxed, to be comfortable, and to be comfortable in bringing friends with you. But I know this: I would never want someone who did not have the fifteen hundred dollar suit to feel uncomfortable because they were sitting next to someone who could by the best of the best. I just want us to be a, a family, and uh, that's kind of where it started 10 years ago. Okay, you said from the beginning. Was that from the beginning of your ministry at the church, or was that from the beginning of the church? Well, I, I came on board uh, Brook Hills a few months after the church had been incorporated, and one of the things I spent three months praying with the church and sharing with them everything about my heart, my philosophy, my understanding of of uh, church polity and churchmanship. And I addressed this issue with them at that time about uh, are, are, are you willing to and, and can we as a body move in these directions. And so uh, these are things that we started in September of 1990 from the very beginning. One thing that is very interesting is that church planters have some challenges that people who go to an existing church don't have. It's not nearly as easy as it looks on the outside, but they also have some opportunities that you may not have when you go to an existing church. The opportunity that comes is the ability to walk with the congregation and intentionally create the style of ministry that you're going to have and things like this. Had Rick gone to a church that was an existing church that had been around for a hundred years, who knows what shape the ministry might have taken. What he has done is to take the opportunity that he had there to help a church in its formative stage shape a direction to reach lost people and unchurched people. But we also heard you say that really the dress is a side deal, that you don't do billboards on this is a casual church and we wear tennis shoes around here. Right. It's a side issue that the main issue is getting people to come who need to hear Jesus Christ so that they could know it. Now, the really burning issue on everybody's mind, and, and my wife just loves the fact that now guys are really struggling with this issue, is how do you know when you're casual enough to be casual, but you're not sloppy or messy? Uh, Rhonda one time was riding behind some guys on a flight who were just going back and forth. Their business had gone to a casual Friday kind of policy, and they were trying to figure out what exactly is casual. So how do you know when you're dressy enough to stand up there and preach with 4,000 people? Well, my wife, Joyce, is my helpmate. And, um, 
There are times Joyce looks at me and she says, don't even go there. <laughs> don't even go there. And um, uh, But it is so affirming when my wife looks at me and she says, that's good. And so my wife is my sounding board, but uh, pretty much it's... Um, I, I I don't want uh, in any way to be abnormal. I, I strive to just try to be the norm. And uh, the interesting thing is one of my hobbies is uh, in relaxation is to play golf. And golfing attire is extremely uh, casual, relaxed, but non-sloppy. I mean, if you go to a golf course, you've got to wear a shirt with a collar a lot of times. And so that's kind of a, a place where I kind of find the middle road there. Okay. Before you sit down, we want to do a word of prayer for you, Rick, and we just want to say again, you know, grace is unmerited favor freely bestowed. That's what God did for us. Grace is what the church at Brook Hills has done for New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary this week. We asked their pastor to come and preach for us three days in chapel, and the church responded in grace by saying, let's don't just send our pastor. We have some lay people who are willing to come and take time off from their work and lead in worship and praise. We want to bring our staff down and see if our staff could interact with some of the classes and talk about just different pieces of how our church functions and how our church lives. And they have freely given to us something that was not expected. Uh, has that ministered to you folks this week? Have you enjoyed being the church at Brook Hills this week? Let's have a word of prayer for Rick and for the, their crew. Father, we thank You so much for this wonderful church, for what they're doing for Your kingdom, the lost people they're reaching, the saved people they're discipling, and the world they have on their heart. We thank You, Father, that You stirred them to make this investment in our seminary this week. And Father, we pray that even as they finish today and begin their journey back home, that You will do more than give them a safe travel home. We pray that You would pour back into them all the energy and strength and wisdom that they poured out on us. Fill them anew, Father, and let them arrive home refreshed and not weary. We pray You'd give them a sweet homecoming with family and friends, that it'd be a blessed time tonight as they get back. We pray that You'd give them a wonderful day tomorrow as they go back to work and back to the church. And we pray, Father, as they gather to worship You at Brook Hills tomorrow night in their worship service, that there would be a great, great spirit of joy, a great spirit of harvest, that You would do a mighty work in that church this weekend as an affirmation of, for them of the sacrifice they've made this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. And now let's worship with the church at Brook Hills. The pool of Bethesda, the pool for those in desperate need of healing, wait for the angel of the Lord to come and stir the restoring waters. It is a vast gray hall with a hole in the ceiling open to the sky. Broad stone steps lead up from the water on its four sides. The pool, continually restless, throws reflections of blue on the ceiling and on the walls. The sick the blind, the malformed, all lie on the steps, waiting. The long stretches of silence are broken from time to time when one or another groans and turns in his rags or raises a fretful wail or cries a sudden cry of exasperation at long, continued pain. The attendants of the sick play at dice, waiting for the call to fling their masters into the pool when the waters are stirred. Beyond the porch, there is a glimpse of the fierce sunlight in the empty street outside. Suddenly, the angel appears upon the top step, unseen to all present. His face and wings shine with a color that is both silver and gold, and the wings of blue and green, tipped in rose, shimmer in the tremulous light. He walks slowly down among the shapeless sleepers and stands gazing into the water that already trembles with anticipation of its virtue. But today, among the invalids that wait and pray for healing, there is someone new, a physician unable to heal his own desperate wound. God, hear my prayer. 
I can't stay here long. I must return to my work. I'm no better than these other men who wait night and day for the stirring of your healing waters, but the truth is, I can't continue to help others when I'm in such desperate need. I have nothing left to give. So here I stand, my heart in pain. Oh, send your angel now. Send your sacred breath to stir up the pool and free me from this old burden. Oh, God, please hear my prayer. Another invalid suddenly wakes up from the nightmare, calling, The angel! The angel has come! I'm cured! And flings himself into the pool, splashing his companions. They all come to life, gazing eagerly at the water. Then, realizing that it was only a dream, they begin to shout, The fool! He was dreaming again! Drive him out of the hall! The mistaken invalid drags himself out of the pool and sits dripping disconsolately on the steps. There was no angel. I was dreaming. But I, I saw him so clearly bending to touch the surface of the water with its wing. Well, better to be wrong and laughed at than miss an opportunity to be cured and leave this stinking pit Behind me forever. The invalid is surprised to see a new face at the pool this day, that of the physician. Who are you? I haven't seen you here before, but you look familiar to me. What do you want here? This is no place for you. This is a place for the sick and the malformed. That man there, he's had running sores for over 40 years. Pain and shame, indescribable. Someone like you can't imagine what that's like. Look at this claw. It was a hand once. Your limbs are whole. You walk without a limb. By some cruel stroke of fate, you might be the first to see the angel, the first to jump in, and a cure would be waiting. This is a place for those in need of healing. Now I recognize you. You're a physician, a doctor. You you cared for my own children. You, above all, have no place here. Go back to your work. Leave miracles to those who need them. Go back to my work. How can I? How can I hope to heal another when I am in such need myself? Oh, please, God, heal me so I can continue. I beg you for renewal and relief. Just let me start over without this fault that drags me down. I'll sit here without ever lifting my eyes from the surface of this pool. I'll be the next. I will not be woken up again by the happy shouts of someone else who's been healed. I will be the next. The angel who has been waiting with timeless patience, now draws near to the pool and holds his hand poised over the shuddering water. Joy and fulfillment, completion, content, rest and release have been promised. The angel, the angel of God. You have seen me. God has willed it so. He heard my prayer then. He has heard it. Drawback, physician. This moment is not for you. No, angel, no. Listen to me, please. The healing is not for you. Why? Surely God is wise. Surely he can see beyond my apparent wholeness to see the desperate need in my heart. Surely he can see the nets in which my wings are caught, the sin into which all my efforts sink hath performed. Surely this isn't hidden from him. He knows. Then he must also see what my heart desires, what I know I could accomplish in love's service, if only I were freed from this bondage. I've never seen the water act like this. Maybe this is the day I'll be healed. I will be the next. I must hurry, physician. See how the sky is afire with the gathering host. It is the hour of a new song among us. The earth itself feels the preparation in the skies and attempts to sing its hymns. Children born in this hour spend all their lives in a sharper longing 
for the perfection that awaits them. Then I must have been born in an hour like this. The flaw in my heart is twice as painful because of what I know I could have been. Oh, please, angel, not a day has passed in all these years that I haven't felt my wounds sharply. Must I go on like this forever? Without your wound, where would your power be? It is your very remorse that makes your low voice tremble into the hearts of men. The very angels themselves cannot persuade the wretched and blundering children of earth, as well as one human being, broken on the wheels of living. In love service, only the wounded soldiers can serve. Draw back. The angel kneels swiftly, drawing his fingers through the water. The pool becomes alive with running ripples that increase as the divine wind strikes the surface. The waves are flung upon the steps. The invalid, who has been watching diligently, casts himself into the pool again as the whole company lurches and rolls toward the water. The invalid emerges, leaping joyfully from the water, his hand restored. The angel smiles for a moment and disappears. Look! Look at my hand! It's as new as a child! Glory be to God. Oh, wait till my family sees. I'm healed. I'm healed. Oh, may you be the next brother. Oh, but, but come with me first to my home. I, it won't take an hour. My, my son is lost in, in dark thoughts. I, I, I just don't understand him. You, you may not remember, but you've seen him before. That, that's when I remembered you. You're the only one that has ever been able to do anything for him. Please, it won't take long. And my wife, we lost a child not quite a year ago. She, she hardly says a word to anyone. I, I, I just know that you can help her. The physician leaves with the man who received the healing he so desperately sought for himself. But he begins to wonder if he didn't receive just what was meant for him after all. As he leaves, he hears the echo of the angel's words. In love's service, only wounded soldiers serve. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my 
myself to you, but God, I want to know you more. In the second stanza, he wrote, my heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. God, that that would be our heart. God, I don't want to be settled here. God, I pray there's never a day that I wake up and say, you know, it's all right to be right here with you, God. God, I want there to be higher ground every day. This is a wonderful song of commitment. As you sing it, make it a prayer of commitment in your heart. Let's sing it together. I'm pressing on the upward way. Oh, God. 
right before Rick comes, let's bow together and just take a moment. We started the service by singing, Lord, everything I am and everything I have, I bring to you. Would you just pray those words to the Father? If you're broken, we saw the physician thought he couldn't do his work because he had broken places. You may be the walking wounded. Well, God's chosen broken things to use. So everything I have, I bring to you. Let's just sing that commitment to the Lord. Just that. Everything I am. Everything I have. And everything I can. I bring to you. You. Father, no halfway commitment from us. God, everything, it's Yours to use. Father, I pray I'd listen close for Your voice. Open the eyes of my heart. Father, go deep with Your Word today. For uh, Teach us. In Your name we pray. Amen. Be seated. Sometimes the Word of God takes one sentence, and in one sentence a statement is so powerful and so profound that it has implications that run throughout the course of our life and our ministries, and it will not let us go. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 is such a text for me. I love the wisdom literature because, especially the Proverbs, full of those one-sentence sermons. There is a church world out there wishing we would get that clue. But aren't you thankful for commentary? Proverbs 28.13 is a principle of truth that has timely, timeless dimensions. Like so many of the proverb verses, it follows the pattern of giving us a balanced perspective or a wisdom perspective. One of the great words you will add to your ministerial and your daily walk of faith life is the word balance. And Proverbs shows us so many times the negative consequences of an act versus the wise and righteous blessings of its counterpart. And Proverbs 28.13 is such a verse. Sometimes the negative precedes the positive. Sometimes it's the positive followed by the negative consequence. Here, the negative comes first. In Proverbs 28.13, the Scriptures remind us that he who covers his sin will not prosper. But 
Thank God for the divine conjunction that settles right at the midpoint that is the fulcrum of faith right here. But the one who will confess and forsake his sins will find mercy. This very verse is in the spirit of Romans reminds us that the rate wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is the negative. There is the positive. And you and I have been commissioned to the glorious challenge of telling this world there is good news. Good news. A lot of times when I study a text, I, I ask questions. There, there is a wonderful element to honest questioning. In 1982, I studied the Proverbs, and some of you were learning to walk that year, and we both share major accomplishments that year. And as I was studying the Proverbs, this verse arrested me. I followed the pattern that many encourage you to do, read a proverb corresponding to the day of the month and and it was the 28th of March that this verse really arrested me in 1982. And I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you today that I'm praying will be transferable concepts. And that you would recognize today that even as the wounded, you have a place to serve. That even as those who at times have been guilty of covering sin and knock off faith balance, by the wind and rain and floods of earthly trial and temptation, that love service is for those who understand that He takes our scars, makes them His stars, takes our weakness and magnifies His strength, and His mercy shows up where I was in need. When I asked questions about verses, for instance, in this text, my first question was, cover. A man who covers his sins, obviously it would mean to conceal, to hide. I think that the very root of this goes so deep, though, that it is more about the spirit of compromise than actual complete hiding. For we know, we know, we know, God knows. And so we can say hide and we can say conceal, but in truth we understand that sovereign, omniscient God knows and the white hot searchlight of the Holy Spirit goes to the deepest, darkest corner of the most remote closet of our soul. And so what it really boils down to practically to cover sin is when you and I seek to attempt to look at sin differently than God does. And in culturized Christianity, we've made such a great game out of this. We call it trying to help God, I'm sure, but we want to categorize sin for, for God. There's big sin, there's little sin. And the way we play that game is big sins are the ones other people are doing, little sins are the ones we'll own up to, and ever there be that massive gray area somewhere in the middle that we're not sure of. Let me tell you something about the gray area. The gray area is not in the plan, design, imagination, or will of the Holy Spirit. I cannot imagine authors of Scripture as they would, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pen such words of truth and principle for life eternal imagining. Now, how close can we get to the line without crossing over? You see, the reality is that our flesh wants there to be a gray area. And our flesh wants there to be a place of compromise. And our flesh would desire for it not to be such an absolute that it is just blatantly in the light or in the dark, righteous or unrighteous, disobedience or obedience. I recognize, as you do, that sin has magnifications of consequence that does vary. But in the eyes of holy, just God, it is either in the camp of obedience or disobedience. It is according to His Word or it is apart from His Word. And so to cover sin is when I'm trying to find a way to feel differently about sin than God does. 
And the Scripture says you will not prosper. Note the word is not prosperity. The Scripture is not saying that if you're not straight with God about sin, you'll not be well off financially, materialistically. You and I both know pagans who have more money than they know what to do with, and that is not the teaching. But the word prosper here is that word that so very clearly is communicated in the Greek word when Jesus talked about blessed are those who have their understanding of spiritual poverty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for all there is of God's righteousness. The word blessed and the word prosper bear within that inner contentment reality. Prosper here is not about your outward circumstances or outward conditions. It is about the inward man. It is about the state of the soul and the heart and the mind so that when you look in a mirror and you can see the person there that you know to be real, that there can still be peace. When you lay on the bed at night and stare into the darkness and frustrations appear to be as demons surrounding your darkness, you can still know peace amid the storm. And the very best of outward circumstances cannot be a substitute for prospering in the inner man. I don't care if you're called to pastor the most glorious church you can ever imagine. If you don't have prospering on the inside, you're in for a nightmare. If you cover your sin, you will not prosper. This is not a suggestion. This is not an opinion. It is a declaration of a truth. Let's deal with this negative part of this verse for just a second. And here's the relaxing part for you. I cannot speak to you about how you cover sin today. I can only speak about how I've done it. I don't know your story, but I know that there have been expressions in my life where I know as a believer... As a believer, I have been guilty of attempting to view sin differently than God does, and I have had times as a believer and a child of God when inwardly there was not the peace and joy that is promised to those who follow Him in righteousness. How do people cover sin? Here's the interesting thing. I sat down back in 1982 and started listing, and I I think I came up with seven or eight things at that time, and I'm not going to bore you with that whole list. But the interesting thing for me was that as I made my own list and began to do a little scriptural research, I found that someone in the Bible had already beat me to it. The Word of God is the most relevant Word we have. Timely, timeless, praise Him for that. How do people cover it? You may relate to one of my ways. I'll just share a couple with you. Number one, I know that there have been times throughout my life, and if I am not on guard today, it'll happen today, I'll find myself attempting to cover my sin by what I'll just call transferring the blame. What a neat way to deal with sin. Blame somebody else for it. Have somebody else that you can point to. And you recognize immediately where I'm going. For you know, the very first time that sinful man ever responded to holy God, that's exactly what happened in the garden. The Scriptures remind us that God had created man and woman and given them paradise and given them this incredible garden. And He blessed them with all types of blessing and all the trees and all the fruit and all of the blessings. And He kept center court for Himself. And He kept that tree apart from them for Himself, so that it might continually be a reminder, as it should be, in the very center of our lives, we have one that we give allegiance to. And the Scriptures tell us that the woman was deceived and the man disobeyed. Whether you're pleading ignorance or rebellion, holy God looks at sin same way every day. And God came walking in the cool of their day. Isn't that just like God? The minute you think you found paradise and the minute you think you got the garden thing happening, the minute life... It's just a little thing. It was a little piece of fruit. It was a little thing. It's one tree for crying out loud. It's not that big a deal. And God comes walking in the cool of their day. And the Scripture reminds us 
And God says, Adam, where are you? Omniscient, sovereign God knows that Adam has recognized now his nakedness. He knows he's hiding behind a palm tree. He knows he's scared to death. But he wants man to come out and respond to him even as the wisdom literature mandates. Oh, Adam, would you just come out and say, oh God, I've blown it. But God finally comes to him and in a face-to-face confrontation, in a one-on-one meeting. Can you hear God say, Adam, my main man, my only man. (laughs) Adam, what happened? And here the creation say, it's that woman. She said it would be okay. She said it would be all right. She's a wonderful friend, marvelous companion, tremendous helpmate. She makes an outstanding fig lasagna. But she said, And by the way, Lord, you're the one who gave her to me. Sometimes in our attempt to transfer blame, we'll even go so far as say, God, you're the one that called me to that church. God, you're the one that gave me those deacons. God, you're the one that called me into ministry. God, you're the one that gave me that wife. God, you're the one that gave me that husband. You did, you did. She said, he did. And he goes to Sister Eve, sang song, second verse. Eve, what happened? It's that slimy snake. He caused me to doubt you. He made me question you. He made me believe that you were the most gigantic cosmic sadist imaginable, that you were so mean and cruel to deny us the tree at center court. And he said we wouldn't die. He said we'd be like God. And he said, she said, they said, transferring blame. Can you relate to that? There's so many ways we could illustrate that. I just want to say to you one thing. It is not a mark of maturity and wisdom that you can calculate multiple ways to blame your circumstances for why there's sin in your life. We are living in a culture today that almost encourages that. Well, you're the way you are because of your father and your mother and a generation past and a generation before that. I want you to understand that I recognize, even as you do, the implications and the impact, the consequences of unrighteousness in home relationships and the problems that they bear. But make no mistake about it, when you stand before the living God one day, you will not be asked to give an account of Daddy. And somewhere in your faith journey, soldier of the cross, you and I must grow up to have the personal integrity that says, Lord God, I will not, I will not stoop so low and be so weak as to blame my circumstances, the people in my life, or the issues surrounding me. I will take responsibility and be accountable for my trust, my faith, my walk, my obedience unto you, Lord God, King of my life. Second way we cover sin sometimes. I just call it play in the game. In the good old Bible belt, it's awful easy to play the game. You can learn the language and speak Christianese and Baptistese with ease. And the truth of the matter is that if we're not careful... We will raise yet another generation of believers who know better how to be a Baptist and how to be a disciple. And they can spit out an order of worship and never tasted the fragrance and the aroma of an encounter with God. If we're not careful, we can be so very clever in our church programming, our church growth, and our church this, and our church that, and we allow that to become our righteousness. And what happens is we can have the most heinous of sin in our life, but we still know how to pray and we know the words to say and we can tell the Bible stories. We can teach them. We can preach them. We can lead others to them. All the while, we do not prosper. Let me tell you what I think is the most miserable existence imaginable. That would be to be a servant of the Most High God, a redeemed, born-again, blood-bought child of God that He wants to use to share Himself with the world and all the time living in misery of sin on the inside and you're just mouthing the truth and speaking the truth and God will use the truth because as yesterday, it's not the man, it's the message. It's not the woman, it's the message. But to be so miserable because all along you're playing a game. 1 Samuel chapter 15 gives us a clear illustration of that. 
Saul is king. He's given a mandate to utterly destroy is the biblical quote that people that has warred against the people of God for so long, the Malachites. Utterly destroyed. Men, women, children, sheepies, goatees, donkeys, everything. And somebody wants to take a passage like that, and the first thing we want to do, rather than really see some of the character issues that are involved, we will say, why would God want that done? And I'm going to give you the answer. You ready? I don't know. It's not my business to understand God. It is my business, my responsibility to obey God. And I am learning. I'm slow, but after three decades of trying now, I am learning that the more I obey Him, the more He reveals Himself to me and makes Himself known and His ways known as I am trusting and obedient to His Word that is known. And you know the story, I hope. If you don't, you'll, you'll get it somewhere here. But the story is that he was instructed to annihilate and he changed the orders that God had given and he spared the life of the king Agag. I find that to be the most revolting name that I've personally ever heard. And I don't know why Saul chose to do this. Maybe it's because they were peers. Maybe they'd been to a king's conference together. I don't know. But he spared the life of King Agag. He disobeyed God. He stepped out of the will of God. This is called sin. And then after the men and the people had been destroyed, the army of Israel and Saul together make a corporate decision. Let's don't waste those good, healthy animals. God said to destroy them, but let's take the healthy ones back home to Mama. That's better stewardship, isn't it? And God came walking in the cool of His day. Sometimes God comes Himself and He'll have a one-on-one with you. Sometimes God will send a prophet. And Samuel comes to find Saul to deal with him. And Saul sees Samuel coming from a distance. And can you get this picture? Do you understand what's happening right now? Saul knows what's going down. Just like you know when you were busted by your parents or a teacher or a coach and you see them walking and they have that look on their face, judgment cometh now. And you haven't heard the questions, but you're already concocting answers. And before the prophet can say a word, Saul does what you and I tend to do when we've been caught. Play church. Talk the church verbiage. Speak religiously. Oh, prophet of God, I'm so glad you're here. Translation, preacher, come on in and have some fried chicken. (laughs) Prophet of God. I have obeyed all the commandments that you have instructed me that the Lord... I've obeyed all the commandments of the Lord God. That's what he said. I've obeyed all the commandments of the Lord God. Now, that's some good talk to a preacher. You go and talk to a prophet. Yeah, I'm right in the will of God, bud. I've kept all the commandments. Quiet time every day. I'm spending time with God, walking in faith, sharing Jesus every day. I'm keeping all the commandments of God. Samuel stops because, you see, a prophet listens to God as much and at times much more so than his audience. And he says, well, what's that bleeding of sheep that I hear? And what's that whatever it is that oxen do that I hear? There's a barnyard rhetoric right now that speaks something is amiss. Now Saul really has to cover that sin. He really has to make sure, oh, 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 and I can see wheels turning in his kingly mind because now the answer has to be in a religious connotation. And he says, uh, we were going to offer all of those animals, thousands of them, as a sacrifice unto God. Yes, sir, preacher, it's going to be the greatest praise and worship service we've ever had. You kind of stepped in and spoiled the surprise, but you need to know we were going to do it all to the glory of God. And Samuel says, it is better to obey God than sacrifice. It is better to be blatantly, lovingly obedient to this Word than to play church and go through the ritual and the routine of religious wreckage. There are some times that we get so deep in the ruts of religious ritual that the only possible horizon we have is the edge of a rut. There's more, bless God! 
And we have become a people who inflict ourselves because we had rather than deal with God openly and honestly about our sin, we cloak it and we cover it and we compromise it and we'll even justify it. God, I'm serving you. That gives me an exemption clause. Oh, you think Jesus died for you and me? You think Jesus died for you and me more than somebody else? You think there's some degree of righteousness given out? You think there's some degree of mercy? Please understand. We can play the game, but we will not prosper. Some of you are dealing with that right now. Finally, sometimes I know I've been guilty of covering my sin by what I'm going to call hiding the shame. Sometimes the only thing you know to do is shh. If nobody knows, nobody else is hurt. If we can keep this quiet, if we can just keep it under the rug, as long as it doesn't get out, if nobody knows, nobody else will be hurt, let's just shh. And we'll cram it deep down somewhere in our soul and in our mental faculties. We'll push it deep down inside our being to the point that we want to forget it, but we know it's there and it stinketh evermore kind of reminds me of 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Scriptures tell us that King David is in a grand season of life. It was the season when kings go off to war, the Scripture says. And perhaps David is negotiating his contract or something, but he stays home. And his soldiers are out in battle and David is at home. He gets a bit complacent. He gets absolutely lazy. As a matter of fact, the Scripture says he rose from his bed at evening time. Dude slept all day long. And he's surveying the city from the balcony, has his kingly robe and all of his kingly glory. My city, my kingdom, my soul. <laughs> and an innocent glance becomes a lustful stare. And a lustful stare becomes an adulterous desire. An adulterous desire becomes an act that a man after God's own heart would commit. Now, if God's best can stumble and fall so quickly, is that not a wake-up call for us mere normal servants? And the sin with Bathsheba will have grave consequences. She discovers she's pregnant. Will David confess it and forsake it? No need to tune in next week. No. Let's just keep it quiet. You know the story. He'll arrange to have Uriah brought in from the battlefield. Go home, spend one night with your wife. Have some time with your wife. You've earned it, my brother! Have you ever noticed how when we start covering sin, we have to lie? Because David knows if he spends one night with Bathsheba, when her pregnancy begins to show, it will be so very obvious, well, the couple's going to have a child. Bless the Lord. We kept it quiet. Nobody hurt. No harm. No foul. Imagine the look on King David's face when he comes in his chamber the next morning and his first lieutenant with a big gomer pile toothy grin says, King, did you hear what Uriah did? Oh no, did he go home last night to be with his wife? No, sir, he didn't. He what? He didn't. He what? No, sir, he slept right here on your steps and he got up and went back to the battlefield so he could be ready to serve the Lord God and to do your will as king and commander. Oh, king, we were so proud of him. We've told everybody in the palace, aren't you thrilled? And David said, hallelujah. <laughs> now the sin of adultery will be compounded into murder. Premeditated murder. You know the story. And God came walking in the cool of His day. Sent one of those nagging preacher prophets by. King, I have to tell you a story. On this side of the road lived a man so wealthy he had thousands in his flocks and herds. Incredibly blessed. On this side of the road across from him lived a man with only one lamb in his entire estate. The wealthy man had company coming from out of town and in the midst of the night stole across the road, took the poor man's only lamb and served him as a feast barbecue for his friends the next day. What should we do? And David was incensed and outraged. He said, that man ought to die. And the preacher said, 
You're the man. But you didn't take a lamb. You took a lady. And we didn't have a barbecue. We just had a burial. It's serious, King. Do you believe the Word of God when it says, be sure your sin will find you out? Could it be that the Word of God is true when it says, do not be deceived? God will not be mocked. What you sow is what you'll reap. There is the positive admonition. But if you confess it and forsake it, you'll find mercy. Sometimes those words may be too hard for us to swallow. And sometimes we want to find some theological reasoning for not truly understanding what it means to forsake or what it means to confess. Just put it in language we can all understand. When it comes to sin in my life that the Holy Spirit puts His finger on, God's Word says do two things. Admit it and quit it. Too many times Satan wants to take God's Word in the normal course of life and reverse it. Specifically, I know he does here. Because right now, if I give to you an appeal this morning to get your life right before God, it would be very easy for you to say, now wait a minute, because here's the way Satan would say it. Just go ahead and quit it. You know you've been blaming some... You've been, you've been bad-mouthing those people at the church, or you've been blaming your circumstances over here. Gotcha. You know that there's sometimes you just go through motions and you're faking it. You're playing a game. Gotcha. You know there's things that you've got deep down inside that nobody else knows about, and if this room became transparent, people could see your sin. It would be mortifying to you. Gotcha. So here's what you do. Just quit it. And then after you have some real longevity of walking the walk and talking the talk, you can admit it. Well, if that's not an invitation to pride, I don't know what is. And the scriptural mandate will always be when the Holy Spirit makes us aware of a need or sin in our life that our response ought to be right then, Oh God, you're right, I'm wrong. I admit it. Here's the grand news. There's nobody on this planet that you have to admit it to. You don't need a priest and you don't need a preacher. You have a Redeemer. And the one we confess sin to is the one who died for our sin. I've seen stories in my life through the years of this very principle being fleshed out. I wish I had time to tell you some of those stories, but I know this. God's Word is true. Admit it. Quit it. Turn from it. That's the word we were talking about yesterday. Repentance. And then you get God's mercy. My prayer for the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary is that you would go into this world Scars and all, wounds and all. But go as wounded soldiers who have been touched by the mercy of God. And sometimes the scars don't go away, but God uses those scarred in ways that only a living, redeeming God could use. Don't count God out of using you, wounded soldier. Love service calls you. Mercy calls you. Let's bow our head. I pray, Heavenly Father, that You would give to us the courage to be straight up with You about areas of disobedience in our life. I pray right now for those of us in this room who on too many occasions have been guilty of blaming something or someone else. I pray, Lord God, that You would give us the integrity to be the living billboard, the living advertisement of the message that we teach or preach. I pray that we would not foster gamesmanship in the kingdom. 
And Father, I feel impressed right now to especially pray for people in this room who have secret sin hidden very, very deep within. I pray, Father, that we would recognize we're building a stronghold for depression. We're building a fertile bed for resentments. We are building weakness rather than strength. I pray, Father, for someone today to be showered by Your mercy, cleaned inside out. I pray for my brother and my friend, Dr. Kelly, for my friend Chuck, for his dear bride, Rhonda, for this wonderful faculty and for this institution. God, I pray that Your protection and Your covering would so guard this campus that sinful lifestyles would not be something that they could on this campus walk with ease. But I pray, God, that You would call us to the highest of standards and to walk in Your Word with purity and integrity, ready to wash the dirty feet of a dirty world. Oh God, take us off our high horses. Take us far away from our gains. And may we reflect true light. In the name of He who was wounded for our wounds, we gladly serve in His name. And we all say, thank you for the privilege to be with you. God bless you.